My name is Yaroslav Halchenko and I'm talking to you from somewhere near Dartmouth College where I'm working at the Center for Open Neuroscience at Psychology and Brain Sciences Department. And the learning objectives of this lecture will be not only to talk about Reproman as a computational uh, platform, but rather also to reiterate on benefits of shell version control and containers, introduce high performance and throughput and cloud computing, and provide examples of how computation could be executed and re-executed with varying trades off uh, in convenience, provenance, efficiency, and reproducibility. Uh, in 2004, uh, we made a goal of producing this one singular platform called NiceMan, Neural Image and Computational Environments Manager. But we quickly learned um, that the field is fast changing, so we need to adopt and we probably should use newer technologies than what we envisioned originally. Also, we quickly realized that there is no panacea. You could hear about either uh, containers are good or bad, they're all useful. And we just need to learn to use them appropriately to take the most benefit from those technologies. Also, we've learned that instead of developing a singular one platform, it's much better to develop smaller projects because they're reusable, could be used uh, in different domains, not necessarily uh, neuroimaging, because execution itself also doesn't have much of neuroimaging in itself. And um, another project which we started spun off from the effect that it's... Um, Computing efficiency itself uh, really heavily affected by how data acquisition is done. If you are acquiring data and not using standards, then you will have worse luck in your um, analysis and how you would need to organize your execution uh, to make it more efficient. And kind of contradicting maybe with the first clause or statement, planning ahead is another uh, lesson we've learned that by doing some, investing your time to learn new technologies and doing the science the right way, uh, you might end up actually more efficient overall uh, when you are done with your project. So, based on those lessons, NiceMan, uh, that neuroimaging computational manager, uh, transformed into a collection of projects. One of them is HudiConf and ReproIn, where HudiConf is for conversion of uh, DICOM images into any layout based on the heuristics. And ReproIn is one of such conventions and heuristics to automate such uh, data collection and uh, possibly initial pre-processing. And I would um, invite you to uh, learn more about ReproIn and um, efficient approaches or uh, uh, call for establishing efficient approaches for data collection in the webinar, uh, which I gave before for Reprenim. Another, uh, not tool per se, but it's rather approach to analysis and computation is Yoda principles, which you heard about uh, two weeks ago from Adina Wagner. So they boil down to modularity, portability, uh, version control systems, which help you to not only make research more reproducible, but also more efficient. So I would advise you to listen to Adina again if you uh, didn't listen careful enough. Another project which I'll mention uh, in, in this talk will be our Reproneum Containers collection, which is hosted on our datasets that datalet.org. That's why we have this triple slash Reproneum Containers, but also it's hosted in just pure Git version without data on GitHub. And finally, and the last but not least, is the Reprement project, which um, the goal of which was actually twofold. Uh, one of them was tracing of execution, so figuring out what have you used and um, give you really nice specs so you could discover it, compare. Uh, and second one is Yoda-friendly execution on available resources, and that's what uh, I'll concentrate in this talk about. So let me start actually with a problem. So we are so busy. How do we do reproducible near image efficiently? And to answer that, I think you've seen this slide, and I would just uh, invite you to visit our website again, repronium.org, five steps, which outline major five steps of any uh, typical neuroimaging research study. And in our talk, we'll concentrate around data processing aspect. Okay, even with this, we still have a problem that there is, we are still so busy, and there are more than a single way to skin a cat, right? So uh, don't worry, no animals were hurt. And how do we approach that? So in general, there is, um, let's consider a typical good scientific workflow. And you've seen this slide probably previously in uh, Dorota's uh, lectures. I just augmented it with postulating the question first. So we have 
an idea or hypothesis, and then we devise experiments, we uh, go through theory, hopefully, and then we do scientific computations of all kinds, produce the result, which actually gives us ideas for next question or what next study to do, right? In this talk, we'll just concentrate on scientific computation part, and we'll try to characterize different approaches, how would we do execution of computation based on these four criteria. So, convenience, provenance, efficiency, and reproducibility. What that would mean in the lame terms. So, what is convenience? Well, just to get it done, right? It's really convenient when we don't need to sweat, but just have computation which we need, be done, and we proceed to the next step, right? Sometimes it also involves learning tools, right? So, that is kind of conflicting uh, idea there. Ideally, we want to be completely lazy, just have it done, and don't learn anything. That would be ultimate convenience, I would say, right? Provenance, what have we done, right? So, how did we get these results when we... Um, got some results, where did they come from? Efficiency. So if we do this computation and we want to do it on this data set, that data set, and we want to do it here and there on different resources and ideally as quickly as possible, right? So that would be efficiency in my case. There is also cost associated in, in efficiency, which I'll mention a few times. And uh, fourth factor is reproducibility, right? So it's tightly related to provenance, so none of them is kind of completely orthogonal from any other. But, and reproducibility and provenance go tightly together, but altogether you can reproduce results of other, uh, others even if you don't know what was done, right? So they're still not completely identical, right? So reproducibility can I or anybody else do it again. So this would be the outline of my talk. And we'll start with basic shell, which is a black box. Hopefully many of you are familiar with it. Then we'll go to data, briefly mention Yoda principles, cover a little bit of containers, then um, data let containers extension, which you also heard from Adina. Then um, we'll talk about our reproneme containers, go into high performance computing, cloud computing, and finally converge on reproneme. So what is shell, right? Oh, that's a wrong one. So what is the shell? What is this black box? Uh, my tale would be, I used to be a avid Windows user and developer. And once I've heard, oh, there is this great programming language, Perl. And I've downloaded Perl and I started it and I saw something like this. It scared me a lot. So since then though, um, I've learned shell and I use it uh, on my daily basis and I, there is no way to escape it. So what is shell about really? Shell, Shell is actually really convenient. It is, you just run your command with some parameters, give it some input, specify where to put output, and you're done, right? So it just accomplishes what it is for. Uh, run the command, as simple as that. But it's really lacking on any other dimension in this one. Let's say provenance, what have I done? Most of the time, people don't even know what was the exit code from previous command. They just saw the flood of output, and then they saw, oh, it's done, let's proceed further. But maybe that command failed. Uh, also, typically, we have no idea about what we are running, what other tools does it use, what are those dependencies, what are versions. So overall, Shell itself doesn't give us much of provenance information. There is, though, one really nice aspect. There is a Shell history or bash history. And I would invite you to um, visit our module reproducible basics on uh, Shell and go into the history section. Because history of Shell is actually a great resource of provenance. In my case, I um, keep all my history and I did find previous analysis, which I've done before, uh, as, oh, this is the third line which I executed 10 years ago, right? So it gives you actually provenance, but it doesn't give you a really association which for which file was it or not. Also, there are uh, supplementary tools like the tracing of Reproman or ReproZip, which allow you to take advantage and uh, trace these dependencies and ReproZip allows you to package it, bundle it into a container. Efficiency. Well, it's, it's just one thing at a time, right? So uh, you could put tasks in the background, you could start multiple terminals, right? Uh, but it's not really about efficiency. Of course, you could use constructs, um, such as, again, loops, right? And the history, so it contributes to efficiency because you could cut and paste your history, create a script and run it. Also, such tools such as cron jobs, they're really nice. It's your batch processing, automation. Have I received new data, right? So there are aspects of shell, which is great. But in general, it's not for efficiency. And reproducibility, uh, good luck with that, right? Unless you start writing the scripts, nobody would be able to reproduce the line which you ran because they wouldn't have a data. Uh, you would need much more to actually make the result, this output one file, uh, reproducible. So 
we still have a problem. Uh, we need to get a cat, so all this data which we analyze, and then we need to know how we skin the cat and um, yeah. So again, no animals were hurt. And let's overview DataLed. The goal of DataLed was actually to provide a tool originally to deliver data. So we had lots of um, separate data resources, Open Neuro, uh, CRCNS, and me and Michael were avid Debian users and developers. And Debian and NeuroDebian, uh, for that sake, our project, um, it gives you great ability to install thousands of software packages, right? Without knowing their, where they're coming from, what they need to download, how to extract, how to build. And we wanted something like that for data resources, which we have already in the field. So DataLed was envisioned as a data distribution. And we based it on Git and Git Annex uh, to just provide access to all these data sets available out there. So the first command you see is DataLed install, right? So you could get a data set, data led data set, and install it on your hard drive without knowing where actually data comes from. But then we realized that we are using a really useful tool underneath. We use version control system. So data led grew into distributed research data management system, which allows you to not only install data resources, but create your own and create them either from scratch, like placing your own data in there or crawl external um, portals and create data sets for them. And then later on, publish them outside. And as you've heard from Adina, there is also this concept of nesting via Git uh, modules, which allows you to compose multiple data sets into a single one without actually introducing the burden that, oh, you have to install the entire one terabyte of data and data sets just to get access maybe to the top level, let's say it would be your fMRI preprocessed data, right? And then also you've heard from Adina about Yoda. So who is Yoda? And Yoda principles are simple. I would invite you to go to and uh, visit our uh, website on GitHub and look at the poster. So one of the principles is really a long line with DataLed that you need to track all input data and code and computational environments needed to produce analysis outputs in version control data sets. And it is really easy to track everything with DataLed because we can support code, we can support complete environment as containers, which we'll talk about. And we also have already lots and lots of data available, um, not only from data sets that data led at work, which provides access to over 200 terabytes of neuroimaging data, uh, not neuroimaging, neuroscience data. And, but also you could create new data, uh, put new data inside. And one of the interesting aspects is Git log, right? So the same Git gives you already all the tools really handy to establish the provenance of your results. And typically it would look something like this, right? So if you used qdconf dash dash data led, which just runs data led after conversion of every subject, you'll see that, oh, it announces I've converted this subject for this session. And then you could also augment this conversion with your own changes, right? And you keep track of that, right? Oh, I removed that bad conversion. If you want to discover more about qdconf and reprint, I again invite you to visit our webinar series um, so let's get back to Yoda. Yoda talked about input data, code, and computational environments. It didn't mention forgotten, uh, although this one looks like more like baby Yoda, not the old one. Um, so if any change is actually computed, right, it's, we can make it easy to just make a record in Git to keep this provenance information. Let's say you produce some file based on the previous state. Let's record that information in the Git, right? And that's what data led run allows you to do. Right? So you could run your script instead of just doing it in a shell, do it some parameters, input, out, output, and then doing data led save, and which wouldn't give any meaningful message. Instead, you just do data led run my script and the input files and all that. And that produces you a nice uh, record in the Git log. So you could later on not only re execute, but also discover what you have done. So data led run uh, from do it and through data led, we've got to this new way to execute. Uh, we, where we advise you not only just do data led run in your commands, but also specify what was input and what would be the output of the command which you're about to run. And then you don't need to spell out or duplicate this information. You could just specify it as curly brackets, inputs, outputs to your command. And if you check uh, help for data led run, it provides you quite a lot of flexibility how to distill from specific parts of inputs or outputs because you could have many. So let's judge this construct based on those four factors. I would say it's really convenient. It's almost as convenient as uh, just do it, right? Um, 
The only hurdle is this input-output specification. And why do we need it? Why do we need it? If your input is a data file, where you would need to get it, right, to do the processing. And that's what data led would do for you. So instead of doing separately data led get, you just specify this input and then it, it would get it. And because it has this record, anybody who would later on would do data led rerun would be able to get this input. Similar applies to outputs in terms of that you need to allow them to be modified and so on. But that it gives you a little bit of hurdle, right? Because you need to specify those parameters. Ideally, you don't have to. Provenance. It adds this provenance record, which is machine readable for data led rerun, but also human readable. You could immediately see how this file came about. If you do git log on this file and kaboom, it gives you already how it came about, right? And there is all this unambiguous uh, version control, right, of all the inputs and outputs. The problem is that it lacks information about environment, right? That record was really minimalistic. Efficiency. Well, it does help you to do it here and there, right? So you could uh, run the command and get that repository and do it also elsewhere, maybe on more data, right? Because you already specified, let's say, inputs. But it's not that efficient, right? There is no built-in mass parallelization or no environments to share and, and only locally. Reproducibility, it gets quite close, right? It gets much better than shell. I would have even probably rated higher. Uh, it's just data-led rerun away. So what is data-led rerun? If you had the original history like this and there was a record um, that A was generated by clean data, you could rerun data led using data led rerun and it will rerun this command and then cherry pick anything which had to be cherry pick because there is no run record or if b also had the run record in it it would rerun those and now you could use your favorite tool git diff to verify that your c and c prime are the same so it's as simple as that and you could use uh, just built-in functionality of git to uh, assist with your reproducibility and of course i would invite you to look um, more about running and rerunning in uh, data led handbook so let's get back to our slide uh, we have it pretty well um, data led run does pretty well but as i've mentioned environment is lacking so we don't have clear provenance for where it was executed efficiency is lacking because we cannot really reproduce the same environment here and there and reproducibility obviously affected as well so let's talk about containers and again, if you want to discover more about containers, please uh, go and listen to Dorota, uh, Dorota's lecture uh, a few weeks back. So what about containers execution or execution of containers or execution in the containerized environments? Here we go. Usually it boils down to some uh, command, which could be Docker or Singularity. And then you are saying that, oh, run the command which that container runs by default. Alternatively, usually there is some ways to provide different entry point. And then you need to bind lots of directories from here and there uh, to put them into that containerized environment. So the tools in the containerized environment see the data you want them to process, right? Then you give a little bit more of options on top of it. And you give the image, either it's a file as in Singularity's case, or it could be um, just in some virtual Docker space. So you give it a name. And then again, you do your do it with those parameters on these inputs and outputs as visible within containerized space. So what about convenience? It's actually really great technology, right? Because uh, now it's portable. I could have my image here and there. Uh, everything will be more or less the same, right? Unless, let's say, if I bind some data from outside, then it might not be the same, right? It might be different data on one host and another one. And um, But in general, it's really convenient but cumbersome with all the parameterizations, especially binding points, they quite often give people headache. Provenance is improved, right? In the sense that at least we know that we've ran something big for which we have this container. It's a black box. We don't know exactly typically what is inside besides that, oh, it's MRI QC 100 or something like that, or fMRI prep. But you could look inside, right? It's not entirely black box, uh, right? So people sometimes call it what gray box, glass box, here we go. And also there are tools to help you to create those containers such as NeuroDocker and uh, IndieFreeze also allows you to create um, containers which could be recreated themselves because those recipes, if you use some software distribution, they might not produce the same container if you rerun from the recipe. Uh, and again, it's really useful to know which version or digest of the container uh, you've used, but typically you don't know, right? If you do just docker run fmri prep latest, you have no idea which version you've ran and 
quite often people might not record it. Well, fMRI prep is good. It, it puts information inside the output, so at least you know. But typically, it's not the case, right? And container technology by itself doesn't store any information about its action and the outputs, right? So you get the output file outputs, you have no clue was it produced in the containerized environment or not. So there is no extra information which would tell you. Efficiency-wise, uh, by themselves, containers also, they, they are just, just there, right? So you run it locally. Um, and Docker is not allowed on high-performance computing, uh, which makes it quite inconvenient. But in general, they solve a huge problem uh, to make computation efficient by being able to share uh, those containerized environments across the infrastructure. And they are not panacea to reproducibility itself, right? As I said, provenance information could be lacking, right? And only information about invocation and input somehow need to be shared alone, right? But also there is another problem. Maybe you've heard the news. Docker Hub decided that old images would be removed, right? If they're not used or paid for. So without some additional infrastructure, which would allow distributed storage or archival uh, for posterity, uh, containers themselves don't give you the, our container hubs um, don't provide complete solution. But again, they're super useful technology. And let's talk to Yoda again. So what if we take those containers, right? Yoda said that let's keep all the modules together on the version control system. And for that reason, we have created extension, datalet container extension, which simplifies addition of containers into datalet datasets. Now in the same datalet dataset, you can have not only code, data, but also entire containers, which might be accessible from Singularity Hub, or you have a copy, or someone else shares a copy and you add he, their repository as a remote to your repository, so you share information about this availability of containers. Uh, and then you could execute similarly how you do it with data led run, you just use data led containers run. Again, much more information is available in the, uh, actually in, in our reproducible training, uh, reproducible <laughs> repro Center for Reproducible Neuroscience training materials, but also in the handbook for data led. So I would invite you to visit those websites. Okay, so let's look at this a little bit more formally. It looks pretty much exactly the same as data led run, uh, but instead of run, we say containers run, and we say which container to use. Mention that there is no uh, binding points to take care about. How magic is that? And that is solely because of Yoda. So let's say thank you to Yoda, uh, because you contained everything inside the data set you're working on. So everything is under your current directory and you could run that computation without messing with all the data points. Uh, of course, those data sets uh, should be data-led data sets to get most benefit. But you could cheat, right? You could create a symlink, just nobody to some external location, maybe uh, actually symlink with containers wouldn't work anyway. So ideally it all works nicely when everything is in data-led. Uh, the same problems uh, that we need to specify inputs, outputs for ideal execution and collection of provenance. Actually provenance information is quite Good, although I should have made it probably lower. We still don't know uh, what is inside the black box, right? We might not know what the tool is, but we know exactly which version of that container we used. We know where to get all the input output data. And we have really clean record. We go from clean state, so everything was committed, and then we do container run, and we get to another clean state. And this change between two states recorded unambiguously in data led. So we have environment, we have data, we have code, everything in there. So provenance information is quite actually well established. Efficiency, well, uh, there is improvement to efficiency. You don't need to waste time, although that's also a convenience, right? Uh, you don't need to waste time on bind points. You just need to have those data sets installed inside the data set, maybe only for the duration of the analysis. And again, it's on the local, uh, local execution. And similar to Provenance reproducibility is really improved and almost reaches maximum. Um, data led rerun still works. So if you uh, try to rerun and you've did good job specifying inputs, outputs, you achieve uh, reproducibility quite easily. And as long as data and containers available from somewhere for data led to fetch, you're all set. If they disappear, you still can just out adjust information and data led within Git Annex branch that, oh, this file is actually now available from another location. And then anybody, not, no, none of those commits which reflect your changes need to be changed. 
it just magically Gitanix will take more newer information about availability and proceed forward. So let's review now a bigger picture. I kept talking about this nesting and you probably see, saw this uh, similar picture in uh, Adina's slides. Yoda tells you to contain everything relevant for specific step of analysis. So there is this kind of hierarchy that you start with just raw data, maybe which is your DICOMs, and then you include raw data as component within your bits data set. So bits allows you for source data folder, right? That's where your raw data should be linked as submodule. And then bits would know that mm, I, that's my sources, right? I, you might not need to install them, right? So you don't have to because they're separate data sets. But then you could use, let's say, data let containers run with some containers to produce outputs within bits data set. And then bits data set would have clear provenance how it came about. And then fMRI prep, the same drill. and you just include bits and all the way up to your paper. So your paper data set or repository doesn't need to contain all of these data sets, but it's great when it would reference them. And then also let me introduce you reprinting containers again. So instead of just adding containers, the same maybe container over and over again into different data sets for different studies, Similarly to the idea of data led being data distribution, we've created a distribution of containers or specifically singularity containers for popular bids apps and um, uh, tools which we've created. So what is that reprinting containers? It's just collection of containers which are hosted um, on Singularity Hub, but also hosted on our data sets that data led that work. So there is redundancy. So if Singularity Hub disappears, we still have a copy and any of those studies would still be reproducible. And then they're also shared on um, GitHub uh, Reprogram containers as the code and Gitanix repository itself. Uh, all those containers semi-automatically constructed from BitZap registry. All of them are unambiguously versioned. Um, there is a helper tool, freeze versions, which I'll show you uh, briefly soon to freeze specific version of a container in this distribution while maybe upgrading all the other ones to the newer versions. So again, to facilitate reproducibility and not jump in between different versions. Also, we are providing singularity command helper which is if you use reprenium containers, it will not just run singularity, run. The problem is that singularity by default exposes home directory inside the container. It pro pushes all its trade-off between convenience and reproducibility, right? It's convenient when you just run a container and everything looks the same as outside besides the tool's different. But for reproducibility, it's a problem, right? If you have something in your home directory, like all the people who do pip, pip install dash dash user or something, right? All of those become available to other Pythons and you might run something in containerized environment, but actually use outside materials, which is a problem. So the singularity command helper sanitizes it quite well, uh, copies your um, git config from outside. So you need to worry about it. And also we are working, well, it, it works, but sometimes not. Uh, to run Singularity through Docker. Let's say those people with aluminum cases, uh, they might want to use Singularity, but Singularity works on Linux. So for you, for them, it would be really easy. They would still use data let containers run and it would start Docker, provide all the necessary bind points inside Docker, then start Singularity. And typically it works, besides when it doesn't. And it takes care about those bind points, as I mentioned. Also, there is a licenses directory where you could put your MATLAB license, let's say, also under Gitanix control, just don't share it anywhere, right? Um, it will be just a MD5 sum of license file, so by itself it's not a secret. Okay, so here is a pretty typical example of how we would do MRI QC analysis using these reprinting containers. Uh, it goes through the same steps as you probably saw in Adina's talk. Uh, we create an analysis data set. Let's say in this case it's a data set from Open Neuro Quality quality control. Um, so we will create a data set, install the container sub data set. Uh, in this case, we decided, oh, let's freeze the version because later on, maybe I want to use, but it's not necessarily, this is pretty much demonstration how you could freeze specific version in case you want to use the same containers collection for different analysis and might want to update it to a newer version later on. And then the actual interesting part comes, not you, but you, yes, uh, data led containers run. We specify the name of the container, that it comes from container sub data set. We specify input is source data output right here, and then specify typical parameters for MRIQC. And at the end, it just works. It runs the container, produces the uh, computation. So this is slight improvement, I would say, over regular containers run. 
is that it's even more convenient and um, we again avoid all the hurdle of binding anything and everything would still work but you have guarantees that later on you will have access to those containers so reproducibility is improved as well okay let's get back into the problematic statements uh, so what if we have more than we can handle on our laptop what we really want is to have something like this right so we have a laptop but behind it there is this huge center of computers right and we run our analysis on them right so we just need to get more power to to reach uh, our destination right and that's where high performance or throughput high, high throughput computing comes into play why i decided to distinguish between the two because they were born from different um different approaches uh let's say high performance computing typically was about tightly coupled parallel jobs like multi uh what is it message passing interface mpi stands for wherever you have multiple computers working and talking to each other all the time to let's say do modeling right and um typically those tasks run relatively short time time hours or days right and then high throughput computing was kind of the opposite it runs much longer right but they are loosely coupled so it's like a workflow. What is a workflow? You've listened from Satra uh, about workflows and data flows um, last week. So, which is a sequence of steps, right? And typically, let's say fMRI prep, it's a workflow, but you don't know because it's already bundled for you conveniently from outside. And that's where something like high throughput computing comes into play where, oh, it's just a bunch of jobs, which one depends on another and just run them. Or embarrassingly parallel, whenever we have thousands of subjects, each analysis is really doesn't care about any other subject analysis right so we just need to run them in parallel and that's called embarrassingly parallel so th there were these two big distinctions and uh you could see examples of platforms uh examples of platforms which um implement those uh slurm is really popular pbs used to be popular like 10 years ago but now i think it, it's going slowly away uh as sun grid engine also not that popular and there is also high throughput condor or just condor uh, typically called which came from high throughput computing um, but also there is a new term many task computing which is kind of comes closer to our domain so instead of me introducing through all the aspects and it's impossible because every one of those have their own way to run the tasks but all of them pretty much require you to create first a submission file some high performance computing or uh, HTC deployments they have helpers which create uh, those submission files and what is typically comes into that submission file this one is taken from a published paper on how do you do pre-processing with fMRI prep so you could get better details from there but typically you announce the name of the job how many nodes in the or jobs in this array of jobs you want to see so in this case we are analyzing 13 subjects so it's from 1 to 13. Uh, you typically announce how long it should take uh, how long per job how many cpus per job you need uh, how much memory per job you need where to put your outputs maybe where to send your mail and then you put all those paths and scripts what you want to run in this case it's singularity run which you know and then you submit that file so that's how typically it's done also for condor syntax is different approach is different how you let's say do this batch array submission but typically it's not just like do it this and here and 100 times right it's a little bit involved although gnu parallel maybe closes to this most concise but most cryptic representation from common line so let's review how it works right and how good it is so you create submission file and then you give it to submitter and it runs it somewhere and then you get results you could query the submitter about the status as it goes along and it's really relatively easy to use you just need to follow the docs and typically this documentation is quite often specific to the center where you're using it so uh consult your hpc admins to give you clear instructions how it should uh how you should run it on yours but there is also variability in how you specify it providence is improved because now you have a file at least which says oh how you executed this and you could put this file into version control system but otherwise it's wild west right so inputs could come from anywhere on the system or download it so who knows efficiency is great though if you have access to high performance computing cluster typically uh it's it's great you fire and forget this thousand jobs and eventually you just they're done or failed and you retrospect uh, sometimes you expect uh, you you can see problems with AO. uh these systems are shared right so there's multiple users using them and 
IO could become a bottleneck. Again, for high performance computing, they were thinking about this, you know, more CPU intensive, not IO intensive jobs. Yeah, when you start bombard this cluster with fMRI prep output dumped by thousands of jobs, then things become a little bit different. And also you might need to invest funds to escape what your institution provides you by default, which could be just, oh, just four parallel jobs once at a time, right? So typically you invest into HPC infrastructure if your institution doesn't provide it unlimited for free. And so there might be cost associated. Reproducibility, if somebody shares with you this S batch or fi uh, batch file, it reveals some details, especially if containers are used. But in general, you need to find that container, especially singularity file, it's just a file, right? And don't dare to run sing uh, singularity pool on every node in your uh, analysis because that just kills singularity hub. Please don't do that. And also the problem is data is typically short lived on high performance computing. You copy it over, you run your analysis, and then you just, um, need to copy it back uh, results and maybe remove it because they are not created to provide you ample storage for a long term. So there is a problem, right? Uh, what if I don't have those money to invest into, you know, HPC, uh, institutional HPC for, uh, to get lots of um, nodes at the same time, uh, but I rapidly need lots of computing power. So how do we do it? And that's where clouds come in. So what is cloud computing in reality is, is that you have this similar to HPC like setup, but which is yours. And it runs somewhere on a much bigger data center than probably any existing HPC is because there is a farm of those in different uh, regions. So cloud computing definition is quite simple and classy. So it's on demand availability of computer system resources, right? For data storage, for computing without direct active management by the user. And what that means that you fire it up and you use some image and you don't need really to manage. Of course, you need to manage if you care about uh, installing more or provide security updates and all that. So you need to maybe uh, manage it, but it's not the main aspect here. And to learn more about cloud computing nitty gritty details, I would just advise you to listen to another lesson which goes into uh, details. But in general, cloud computing you, you typically don't do it directly besides maybe running a few nodes uh, just to experiment or run rapidly on some big instance with lots of memory. You would want to use tools which facilitate you access to these resources. Okay, so let's summarize cloud computing. That the great thing, can, it's actually quite convenient after you learn it. So there is know-how need to be learned and it could become costly very quickly, especially if you leak your credentials. And it's always available there, but there is a problem that it's not just the cloud, there are clouds, right? And they all have somewhat different tooling, somewhat different approaches. And um, you pretty much need to choose one maybe, uh, or again, use tools which maybe allow you to interface to multiple. Provenance, it doesn't really help you much, uh, besides that you might know exactly which computer it was ran on, right? Because if AMI number is shared, um, then you might be able to just instantiate exactly the same computer. The problem is that those AMIs eventually get deleted from, where, um, from the marketplace. So for reproducibility's sake, Maybe not that important, although you have this amount of prominence. And uh, efficiency-wise, it can scale arbitrarily for your, let's say you have HPC cluster, but it doesn't have GPUs. Cloud has everything, so you could create really high memory nodes. You could create, uh, you could use GPU nodes, uh, but you need some extra layer or tooling to scale up, right? So cluster in the cloud, services like AWS Batch or additional tools. And again, reproducibility might be costly, right? Okay. so. The danger zone uh, with greater power comes greater responsibility. Cloud services could become unexpectedly very costly. So please monitor your cloud dashboard and set alarms to announce you whenever maybe you exceeded some amount of funds allocated for your cloud computing. So, and here we come to the last uh, topic on um, my talk agenda, which is Reproman and where all the roads lead to. So what Reproman is about is about centralized registry of resources available to you and helpers to just define those resources or create them, such as I'll demonstrate, oh, let's create a Condor cluster in the cloud. And then simple unified interface to interact with those resources. It doesn't provide all possible resources management, but basic commands, which I typically do on a daily basis, I just log into some remote node, I start some job, I stop some job. So this is the amount of interface we aim for. And then provide convenience for a unified interface to different batch systems. 
So that's our goals. And this is the reprimand primer. Let's say if you have access to your HPC, you could say that I'll register in my uh, reprimand HPC as the one where you need to SSH to into this uh, host, right? Or create me maybe Amazon EC2 instance with Nitric. By default, we use Nitric AMI, but you could specify any AMI in any zone which you like, or you could create entire cluster. Well, in this case, I wasn't too greedy. I said, mm, create a cluster with three nodes in the cloud. Each one of them will be a little bit more than default, uh, which we use. And then you could use ls command to list resource available and their state and start, stop, or delete those resources. And then the last but not least command is run, where we try to provide convenience to run uh, ex computation on the remote resources uh, based on all those lessons which we've learned so far. So here is an example how would we do a, pretty much exactly the same MRIQC script. Uh, so all from original one, which you saw from reprinting containers stayed the same. We only change containers run. So instead of containers run, we'll use reprimand run. And the only differences in there are now that we can specify what are our batch parameters. So here you could see that we have batch parameters I want to do on subject two and three, and we will follow execution. So by default, it would just fire it up and then you would need to run uh, reprimand jobs to refresh uh, the status. And we specify which container to use. And after you're done, you just delete that resource and pay the bill. So overall, oh, if you click on that image, you'll end up on the website. Let me switch to the next page. Let me just illustrate what is it really about. We start with a cloud in which we already have resources, right? So we have open neuro data sets, which are data-led data sets. We have data-led conta reprinium containers, which are also data-led data sets, right? And they can come from different places. And then we start a new computation. Here it should have said reprimand create that EC2 in the cloud, uh, where we create a new instance in EC2, and then we execute the command. This one is command is shorter, just so it could fit in the screen. And we could query for um, reprimand jobs to see is that still running or is it done? And after you are satisfied or if it's finished, you could just run reprimand jobs for that job and it would fetch all the results to your local computer from the cloud. And note that in this case, actual data doesn't even need to be downloaded to your laptop. Everything ran in the, in the cloud. And in such invocation, let's say we even get our regular reprimand run um, command record it in git history although it depending on which orchestrator you use it might or might not be there okay so what is reprimand run uh, convenience wise it makes things more convenient when you know how to use it and when it works so it's still work in progress on uh, making it universally kind of applicable to different um, setups as i mentioned different setups even of the same slurm or condor they could have intricacies and needs more documentation. But provenance wise, you get pretty much everything. You have containers, you have commands executed, you still don't know what is inside those containers. So I should have should have not put it to the end. Um, and efficiency wise, I think it's like yesterday preparing the slides, I first ran it on my HPC and then I've ran it in the cloud. So it was really convenient. I could switch between the two and it was the same reprimand command besides just switching uh, which resource to use. And reproducibility wise, uh, you have the spec file for your run so you have all the gory details where it was ran and which orchestrator was used so everything is in there uh reprimand rerun we are still working on but in general you could use reprimand run with that spec to rerun the same computation so let me just give you an executive summary for the entire talk uh first of all no cats were hurt uh there is no panacea uh, but many technologies are useful. I think I've said that before, but repetition is good for psychology. And containers are great, right? Again, they don't provide complete solution, but they provide you this portable environment. Distributed research research data management systems, such as data that allow you extreme flexibility with data management. And you could try, and I encourage you to try different tools to see which one fits best your needs. And after all, Shell is great, I bet, more you're uh, into your image and data analysis, a uh, big part of you is confronted with shell at some point. So I just would advise you not to uh, despise it, but actually learn it. Standards, the best about standards, it's just you don't have to see them, right? I haven't mentioned standard 
uh, like bits in my talk, but it made all of that work, right? MRIQC works on bits, produces uh, output. So it makes things work and standards are great. And in those tools, you saw that we have to specify input output for te technical reasons primarily. But that facilitates also reproducibility, right? Because it gives better idea what were inputs and what were outputs. Of course, in proper workflow, you have to do it. But I gave you the tools, which are just helpers, right? So uh, they just encourage you to specify this. And more info you could find in previous talks and also other materials online. And on that note, I thank you and saying goodbye.